And here we are. Good afternoon, everyone. We have made it to two Thursday, uh, two Thursday, two thirty on Tuesday, April twenty first, and I am excited. Uh, to introduce you to our next guest, but at the same time, I'm a little sad because this is our final session of this particular lecture series. But do not fret, we are going to bring the series back this summer and we're going to bring it back again in the fall. Uh, we've had so much support, um, supporting our students in this new construct of, of learning. Um, as you know, as a result of the pandemic, we've moved all of our courses at Prairie View a University as at just about every school in the nation to an online platform so that we can continue, can continue education during these times. And because I teach uh, film and television production, um, I teach courses where students are actively uh, grabbing equipment, shooting content, um, you know, jumpstarting their careers, making leaps towards their goals of being filmmakers. And it's hard to do that just sitting behind a mic, sitting at your desk, um, sitting behind your camera and, and trying to engage them in practical ways that they'll understand in this forum. So um, I, I gave a call to a handful of my friends. My first call was to Darnell Lamont Walker, who uh, my first call was my first guest. If that tells you anything about how um, supportive my collective has been for our students and um, giving them a continued experience in enriching, enriching education, um, this uh, lecture series has, has just gone above and beyond um, that expectation. We've had some amazing people talk to our students about what it means to work in the real world, um, not just in the theoretical world. Um, giving our students such great nuggets towards their, their goals of moving into the industry. And um, within this online construct, we couldn't have asked for a better masterclass. And so thank you to all 19 19 of our, uh, you know, of our sessions, our members in our sessions. And number 19 is incredibly special to all of us here on the Hill because she is a child of the Hill. She's a PV alum. Um, she's a productive Panther by just absolute definition. If you were to, to go and find out who's among the busiest, most important people in Hollywood. Yes, I am saying most important are our sisters who are out there making decisions and producing content and directing and, and writing. And Moronike Jola, Jola? Yes. Jola, yes. Jola, mm -hmm. I'm making it all fancy. <laughs> just putting my shoulder into it. Uh, she's one of those phenomenal women who are changing the nature of the industry. And so we're so happy to have Moronike join us today. Hey sis. Hello, how are you? I'm so happy to be here. Y'all do not understand. Hold on, let me yeah. turn this phone down. All of a sudden, it's making noises. <laughs> um, we're, hi, we're ecstatic <laughs> to have you as well. And um, I'm going to ask once he gets settled, if he if he doesn't mind, if he's interested, is have Tony Clomax turn his camera on and join us um, okay. in this opening session as well, because um, Mornike reached out to Tony, and um, it's it's funny because. Uh, as I was setting this up just now, I communicated that I reached out to some of my personal friends, people that I've even uh, I, I've either taught in their life, that being Darnell or Tiffany, or personal friends who, you know, with whom I was in the trenches with when I was uh, working in Los Angeles. So Dalila Ali Raja, um, Gloria Bigelow, Tamika Miller, uh, Anita Cal, and I just reached out to a bunch of people that I knew, saying, "I, I need a favor. I'm not asking you to come and do a thing for Prairie View." TDV needs a favor. And so I reached out to a collective of my friends. Not one of them said no. Everyone said yes. And it was supposed to, you know, be like maybe a six, seven episode series, and it just blossomed. <laughs> and you were one of those people who were watching and supporting from the wings, and you reached out to Tony, and Tony reached out to you or whomever contacted whom, but um, he communicated to me. He, he's like, you, You've got to talk to this sister. You you gotta you gotta let her know. And I was like, Oh. 
And so I'm so <laughs> happy that that connection was made um, because, you know, we have lost touch um, mm-hmm. in our department with mm-hmm. a lot of our alum mm-hmm. and having J.O. Malone, for instance, come back to the Hill and shoot his mm-hmm. feature, um, not only put us back in touch with him as a university, but uh, he's, you know, uh, been a great contact also for saying, hey, you should probably contact this person or reach out to that person. They graduated in this year, their class of that year. So um, we're glad we have you in the fold, back into the fold. And just know that um, we're going we're developing so many new things through our department with the the new collective of teachers that we have there working for our masscom students and I hope you can continue to be a part of that growth for us oh absolutely that is a you know a hope and dream of mine and yeah no I bogarted somebody I can't remember whose um, page I was like hello I'm right here how you not gonna call me yeah of course with a little bit of love but um and then he was on it and like five minutes later he connected us so um i am happy you know i've always wanted to um give back to pv and i you know i met with the president and i have one of the people i went to school with is teaching there and uh i was there for homecoming what in 2018 i tried to like get in the hilliard hall but there was fences and i was like ah so i'm back (laughs) y'all good good well you know we're currently renovating um the tv studio and we're turning room 144 into a sound stage uh in hilliard so the next time you come on campus uh you will have full access and (laughs) vip treatment and all the things there will be no fences in your (laughs) way there will be no fences there will be no fences uh hey tony uh welcome 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 to the conversation brother hey hey tony how are you good i like your uh i like this my head wrap yes thank you orange is my color (laughs) (laughs) yeah you look amazing um let's start off by asking you to tell us who you are and Mm -hmm. what you do tell us tell us the you know a little bio about yourself Okay, so I'm kind of just gonna break it down kind of where I am now and kind of how I got here. So where I am now is I'm a director um, and I'm currently in the Directors Guild of America. I'm also in the Producers Guild of America. I'm repped by one of the top five agencies, um, ICM. I've directed four episodes of television, uh, one for Netflix, uh, three for Disney. I've directed a feature for TV One I've directed and co-EP'd a digital series funded by Google that's streaming on Amazon. But that just looks so great and easy, but um, it's been a long journey to get here. And so how did I get here? Well, I started as an undergrad in communications at Prairie View. Um, I was in Hilliard Hall, MassCom, um, marketing and political science minor, I believe. I think I did, I think I ended up with um, marketing. I can't even remember. So journalism was my first love. Um, but I will say, and we didn't have like film and TV. It was, it was pretty much journalism and like broadcast. Um, but I, I must say that the inkling of how I got there definitely started at PV, um, in two ways we had to do, you know, a news report for, t- for TV. And so we had our cameras and, and I remember loving like picking the visuals, you know, for this documentary or whatever we were doing. And then also my, our professor um, at the time, Ms. Means, at one point she told us to write a television script for a TV show. And I was like, what? <laughs> but I was like, wow. So listen, when I, when I was at Prairie View, so this was the height, this was the 90s. This was, we would all gather in Drew Hall and watch A Different World together. Like all of us in there, it was like hundreds of us. It was amazing. It was, it was the best of times. So to, but I didn't realize, you know, that people were behind putting this together as, as silly as that seems. And so her just doing that and me having an excitement of an idea for an episode was amazing. But I was still very much on the um, journalism track. I, um, during my time at Prairie View, I interned first, I was at the Sacramento Bee. I was a Chips Quinn, Chips Quinn Scholar, which is um, Gannett, so Sacramento Bee. Then I uh, was a, I'm from the DC area. Then I got an internship at the Washington Post, which is amazing because that was, you know, the dream at the time. 
And um, from that, I ended up being um, a freelancer for them, a general assignments freelancer. So mm -hmm. I was well on my way. You know, I was already at the top, one of the top papers in the in the states. Um, but something just wasn't it. And I was like, mm -hmm. I, you know, I learned a lot, and I I came to the conclusion. I won't get that deep into it, but we can talk later. But um, that I could tell more truth and fiction. And I've always wanted to be one who gave a voice. And I was like, I'm going to film school. So this was at the time I was covering um, telecom on the Hill for another uh, organization called the Bureau of National Affairs. Sometimes I'd be in the White House, in the White House. Um, you know, I'd be in the press room. Um, so, you know, again, I was on my way to a successful path as a journalist and um, I was like, I'm going to film school. So um, I enrolled at American University, which is in DC. They have a great film and video program. I got my master's there. Um, there was a little bit of a culture thing. Um, <laughs> so I was like, you know what? And so I, I uh, petitioned that I'm able to take my screenwriting courses at Howard. And so I did that. And I actually took some other, um, I took another film course there as well. It's part of the consortium there. I worked with Haile Garima, you know, I got, he got to teach, you know, I got to be under his wing and um, my, my thesis film, I did, I was very proud of it. And it ended up on, I think it was called Black Stars at the time, but something, it was stars for black people. <laughs> and so that was amazing. That was right out the gate. And I'm like, I've made it, but I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know where to go. Um, the resources that exist now did not exist then. Um, and I took a little bit of a, and it's also that feeling of kind of wanting to have a safe career. And, um, I had the opportunity to produce for Rap City on BET. Um, yeah, so no small, you know, nothing bad about that. I love hip hop. I love music. Um, they needed freelance at the time. And so I used my visual skills producing some really innovative, interviews, um, et cetera, for Rap City um, and for BET. And so I really got into the entertainment television world and I've been in that world uh, for most of my career. So I guess this is now my second career, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, through there, I dabbled a little bit writing, um, but I hadn't really done a film. Um, and so what I did, um, I finally took the leap and moved to Los Angeles. So I've been here for about 13 years and uh, the journey has been difficult because I had to rebuild my entire network. Yeah. Moving to LA and someone, one of my friends, cause I had other people who had re relocated and I was like, I don't understand this place. <laughs> moving to LA, he was like, listen, moving to LA is like moving to another country. And I was like, God, you're right. It's not like when you go to any other, you know, city or state, you know, I've lived in other places. There's something you have to start over. You have to build your network. It's yeah. a completely different culture. Yeah. And so I had been, you know, I'm sorry, after BT, I lived in New York for a while. I was at MTV News. Um, I was producing and, and um, nurturing Sway. Like we st he started the day before, day after I did. And I, um, myself and a few others, He'll, he'll credit myself and my colleague, Elon Johnson. We helped him um, learn how to host TV because he was a radio person. So he knew yeah. how to do that, but we were doing live television, daily hits. And so it was amazing and fun and all of that. Um, and so, you know, I, I had really great credits and really great, um, you know, experience. And I moved to LA and I could not get a job. <laughs> yeah. Not get a job. Could yeah. not get a job yeah. and um it was very strange to me and it was also a shift in the in the industry at that time mm -hmm. so i you know i remember i took a pa job driving um artists around that i had either produced directed or created shows for and you just have to you know you have to humble yourself mm -hmm. so i refocused i built i built my network i hustled um, just to get jobs to, you know, work. And for, at that time, that was more in the, you know, it was shifting reality was coming 
bigger. I hadn't really done that. It wasn't named that what we were doing, even if we were at MTV, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so I was just kind of in a survival mode for a while. Also didn't know anyone in the scripted world. Didn't sure. even know scripted was a term. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Versus unscripted. And um, once I kind of, so I built my career here. I built it back up um, so to showrunner status, show running like the red carpets for the BET Awards, um, for Soul Train Awards, producing the Image Awards, um, doing docu-series like uh, The American Race that starred Charles Barkley, doing different shows here. But along the lines, I realized my friends kept introducing me as a producer. She's a great producer. She's, and I'm like, oh, that's so great, but I'm a director. Cause at a heart, I'm a director. And I realized that I had to reshift and rebuild and did that by um, directing, producing, writing a web series with a great friend of mine named Pepper. Um, it was at a time when Things were really um, slow here in LA. It was kind of after the, after the recession. I had a group of about seven women and we called ourselves BGRLA, Black Girls Rule LA. We were a, ma a magical group. Um, one is a lawyer, one is a VP of this one. And so we are all from different places, but we really connected and supported each other. And one of them was like, let's collaborate on something. And so my friend Pepper had a digital series that she wanted to um, maybe turn into, she had a digital ebook. I'm like, hey, let's turn this into a series. And so it was amazing because we worked, we drank wine, we wrote the scripts. I helped her transition what was in that book into this is how it would play visually. And this is how, it, you know, and we did uh, several episodes and just on a whim, because I was very um, resistant to, I'm not doing a YouTube anything. You know what I mean? I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and so we did it. And then we found out about this uh, web series festival called LA Web Fest. And I was like, okay, well, let's just, you know, what is this world? Let's turn it in. And then that night we went and we won in like seven categories. Oh, we wow. won rest comedy, we won writing, we won producing, we won editing, cinematography, music. The music was done by my friend who's the lawyer who loves music, you know, so it was just amazing. That's where I met Tony actually um, at uh, LA Web Fest. So from there, um, you know, that was me building my reel as a director, right? And it started mm -hmm. there. And from there I continued, you know, I got another opportunity. I directed Black and Sexy. TV, the first season of Sexless. From there, I got Google. From there, you know, and so that's where it started. So that's mm -hmm. in just my story. Wow. Yeah, Tony, um, tell us about that time period for you in terms of um, having, you know, your your work in in that festival as well. Um, the, the circumstances upon which the two of you met. Uh, so this is 2010, right? Uh, 11. 11. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause I was there, I was in 2010 with 12 steps to recovery. And so we won a bunch of awards and stuff. And in 2011, it was, um, uh, disciplinary actions, which was a, was a big change from doing a romantic comedy to a, a procedural, a, a dramatic procedural and stuff. So, but I, one of the things that I remember, you know, about that festival and rest in peace, the, the, um, the Michael, yeah. founder um, of it, but man, everybody was hungry, you know, you know, you know, folks were told that they couldn't do this and they couldn't do that. So people went out, got equipment and, and made, you know, they made a, a TV show. Yeah. It just happened to be online. Yep. And, and I mean, stuff that you, you know, you didn't think uh, like, how, how did that person come up with that? So it was, it was a nice variety of content and everybody, like I said, everybody was talented, everybody was hungry and everybody pretty much wanted to build together. And, and I, and that's one of the things that I remember about that. Just everybody just coming together and just feeding off each other and just, just wanting an opportunity. And, yeah. and, and we, and we all in that room created our own opportunity. So that's the, mm -hmm. that's the big thing that came out for me. 
Absolutely. It was uh, the energy there. And for me, it was really a revelation. First, you know, doing it. And I'm going to kind of get into, if I can, I have like these 10 commandments of how to thrive in, in business, but the actual in this business, but the actual shift of me saying, okay, I can do YouTube. I shouldn't look down on this. You know, I need to like kind of adjust. And then that energy of seeing everyone, you know, taking your creativity into your own hands and not having to wait for someone uh, was uh, an amazing feeling. And yes, um, Michael Jacque uh, started this and people thought he was crazy at the time. And so many people copied, you know, after, um, and he did pass away. He was a wonderful, wonderful soul and just so encouraging to so many people. Wow. How, before you get into, before you get into your lecture, tell us how you're mm -hmm. faring during this pandemic. How are you, as, how are you feeling? How's your personal well-being? Um, and then also how has this impacted the work that you do? Okay. Well, um, I'm faring okay. There's up days and down days. Um, it's somewhat quiet in my house, not right now, but it could be a circus at any minute. So beware. <laughs> um, I have a seven-year-old and an 11-year-old. Uh, there might be chaos. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you know, I'm juggling. Some things are still going on. So I'm juggling, still trying to like kind of have meetings or getting to know people, still trying to um, write certain things or, you know, you kind of still have to network and check on people and that with, you know, scrubbing the house uh, and homeschooling two kids. It's a lot. Um, yeah. For me professionally, um, you know, I, I did family reunion last March. Uh, they loved my episode. It was a great experience. And so they called me back for season two and they gave me two episodes. And my second episode was uh, to film on the 20th of March, mm -hmm. but on that week before is when everything shut down. So, yeah. you know, that's one thing that, you know, television for the most part is a gig economy. Um, and so if you're not working, there's not like, oh, you know, it, it's a gig economy. And so you always have to be hustling for the next opportunity. Um, but I will say that because- Sally? There we go. Can you hear me? It came back just now, yep. Okay, wait, let me just, I'm gonna take this off. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you before. You can put, keep that in if it, if it helps. Oh, no, because I think these are kind of, janky and they're going in and out so is okay. there an echo no 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 you're good okay perfect so um so because and especially if you're in um unscripted and reality you have you have little or no protections as a as a producer or someone on that staff um but because i'm in dga and because um, of Netflix being so great, they're making arrangements and the DGA, I think, um, fought for this, that I will still get paid for that episode. So that's like a huge mm -hmm. relief because it's yeah. been, you know, financially it's, it's been up and down and things were just leveling out and, you know, then this hit. Yeah, wow. Okay, we'll tell you what, we are going to close our mic and our cameras and we're gonna turn our cameras, close our mics and turn everything over to you. Teach okay. us a thing. All right. Well, everyone, um, what I wanted to do is kind of give you my 10 commandments for thriving in television um, in this business and TV and film, whether you want to be um, broadcast, um, journalists, whether you want to be a director, a writer, um, these are 10 things that I think I know will um, influence and, and, and lead to your success in this business. Um, and so the first uh, commandment is, I truly believe that your passion is your purpose, right? So you guys have different things that you're passionate about. And I really believe that's God's purpose for you and that you need to, you should pursue that and always remember your why and your gift. So what I call it is using my mojo, right? So use your mojo. There's something that each of us has that is special um, that we're contributing to um, society. And so um, don't ever forget that your passion is your purpose because 
when you're in different situations or sometimes you will be led astray from your passion, especially if you are multi-talented, especially if you have, you know, like for example, when I'm talking about, I was at the Washington Post. Yes, I was a really great writer and journalist. That wasn't my passion. I could have continued on that track you know what I'm saying? But I had to really um, kind of have a self check with myself of what do I really, really want to be doing? Because that is the fire in you and there's a reason it's there. Okay. So I can still use my writing skills, but I want to be doing this. Right. Um, all right. So that's number one. Number two, you know, people say word is bond. Your word is your bond, but your work is your bond too. So doing great work gets you more work, period. Um, whatever the position that you're in, whether you're hired as a PA or the showrunner, you must do great work. Um, a few tips underneath that is, um, cause this tends to happen, especially because we're looking, we're all out here hustling and looking for opportunities in this business. Don't commit to something and then flake on them or say, Oh, I'm sorry. I got another, even if you're working for free, right? If you've committed to being the gaffer or to do the audio or to be the PA on someone's film, you need to do that, all right? Um, regardless of if another job comes, unless you've said, I might not be available, you just need to be open with people. It puts a really bad taste in people's mouth. And even on the, on the like network bigger side, you know, I've just been on some calls with people, you know, who are running shows that you've all watched and they still remember that one, whether it could have been a director, a DP who, who left them, who said, oh, I got another gig and I um, won't be actually be able to do the show next week. They'll never get hired again from that person because they didn't do it in an honorable way. Um, if you let people know ahead of time, I might have a conflict, but once you commit to working on a show, you need to honor that commitment. Um, in some cases, it's okay to replace yourself. If at the very least have someone in your back pocket that you know is amazing, that you can replace yourself. Um, and, but in general, you know, again, you have to have that conversation ahead of time. This works a lot in, in the fields. Um, like I've seen it worked in script supervisor. I've seen it work in hair and makeup um, where it's a little more part of what they do. But when you're on the creative producing side, that's a no-no. Um, and then as still in your work as your bond, knowing you need to work your way up and you need to do your job. So let's say you're a PA, a production assistant, but you want to be the producer or segment producer. That's fine. But you got hired to be the PA. Do that job well. They will notice you. We notice everyone. We notice people who have potential. You might get more opportunities within that job, but don't skip over your job and then start trying to do the AP job who you're working with. And they're like, oh, did you get the copies made? Did you? Oh, no because that's going to mess you up too. So yes, um, ambition and hustle is important, but you've got to do it within your lane, right? And then the other thing is you can't skip steps. One of the great things um, that I think is of benefit to me is I've worked my way through most of the positions or know them. So even as a showrunner, I know what an AP should be doing. Um, I, I can write the script if I need to write the script. So if anything falls out, I understand it. But when you work your way up, you need to understand it too, because that enables when that opportunity does come, you say, oh, I know how to do host cards, or I know how to um, do the rundown. You know, I can help. And you can, that's how you get to the next level. So work your way up. All right. So that's number two. All right. Number three build authentic relationships um, in television. And I, I would say in all businesses, but specifically, I know for sure in TV and film, your network is your lifeline. Um, you, brought, you have to broaden it, you need to um, nurture it. So what I'm saying, um, let me just give you an example. I've told you about all of the positions that I've had, or a lot of them, and I've had probably over you know, 100 jobs, because I might work six to 10 to 12 jobs a year, right? I haven't gotten any of those jobs without someone 
who I knew except one time in my entire career. One time I applied for a job cold, got a call cold um, from, you know, online. Everyone else was a referral. Um, someone telling me, someone um, mentioning my name. Why? Because I had done good work in the past and because we have a real actual relationship. So what that means for you guys as you're coming up is you, you, you don't just ask random people to mentor you, right? You are in the situations and over time you develop those, those professional friendships, right? The way you do that now, other than, you know, obviously you're, if you're doing, you know, different work, but like internships, you guys should be intern, interning now and every opportunity that you can in places outside of your circle so that you are able to, um, I mean, intern, even get a job, you know what I'm saying? Um, my intern when I was, Rap City was, act, I used it as an internship. They were hiring me, but I got intern credit for it. So um, this is how you develop those relationships. All the people that have spoken to you today, you know, you should be following them on, on social media and you should be keeping in touch as best you can. Not hounding, but just keeping. And then when the time is right, you're saying, oh, I did this, or hey, I wanted you to check this out, or congratulations on this, okay? Um, the next thing that's really, really important, especially as you grow in this business, is that you should always be learning. So you continue to learn and hone your craft because tools change in this industry, jobs change in this industry. There are different work environments there are different ways to do things. So for example, um, I know really, really great editors, you know, that have come up in the game that I've worked with that they now are missing out on jobs because they're like, Avid, Avid is the way to go. And they're becoming like, oh, you know, and they refuse to learn Premiere. Well, Premiere is what everybody's using or a lot of people are turning to. It does not hurt you to learn that and have another um, tool in your toolkit, right? Same thing with jobs. Um, I remember the first time I was on a set and I'm like, what is a DIT? Who, you know, I'm looking at the, that job didn't exist before, but now you have the DIT and they're the person who's digitizing all of the footage and organizing it before it goes to post-production, right? So if you're not learning, you know, even me, I need to continue learning. Um, there are writers um, that are professional writers in Hollywood that are still taking writing classes. Okay, so do not look down or think that less of like, oh, I don't need to learn. You, oh, that's the way that you survive. You have to adjust. Um, and then number five, create your own content. Create your own content. Um, if you're, especially if your day job doesn't align with your passion, um, you should always be creating your own content, especially now while you're in college, especially because you guys have the tools that we did not have. Um, you know, aside from the equipment that you have at Prairie View, you can do something on your phone, right? And so you need to be building up your, your reel of work and its practice. And it's, you know, when I did the Brown Betty's Guide, that was the web series, it really opened up something for me because I hadn't been doing stuff that I personally cared about and was passionate about, right? And so that reignited it um, and it opened doors for me. I didn't know what they were gonna be, but the fact that I was just doing it made a difference. Um, people are looking at you and your work, whether you know it or not. And so you always just have to continue creating your content and keeping your vision. Um, there was times when I, you know, I'm a mom of two, as I just said, after I had my daughter, my youngest, my youngest child, I got out of television for a little bit. Um, and I worked like at a nonprofit doing the same things. I was, you know, filming and editing and stuff, but within like certain framework, but I still did 
creative things on the side. And I, on the weekends, I would still take gigs in television so that I would keep that up. So there's always time for it. And it's very important that you do that. Um, right now, that's what people are looking at. They want to see your voice. They want to see what you're capable of. Um, and they want to see your creativity. Um, this is really important and you guys are doing it now and it's something that we have to do all the time. You must understand and embrace the importance of pivoting, okay? Pivoting, adjusting. Pivoting is problem solving, right? So you might discover two years from now, a year from now, three years from now, that you actually like writing more than directing or producing more than writing, or you don't wanna be a broadcast journalist, you wanna be a marketer. Well, you need to pivot. It's okay. Don't let yourself get stuck because you're on a certain track. You, again, it goes back to the self-check and to the passion. So you strategize and you adjust so you get back on track. And then in production, whether it's uh, a live production, whether you're directing something on set, whether you're in news, again, I said pivoting is problem solving. There are so many things that happen in production that are unexpected. And you have to know how to adjust so that production can continue smoothly. You're not freaking out, but that you're like, okay, well, uh, this actor is not here anymore. Let's do this scene. Or there's been times, um, and this goes to Kristen, like we're doing a live show. Our host isn't really quite getting it. And we're trying to switch the script around. So we're like, no, just do this, do that. In the heat of the moment, we have to work together and figure out the best solution to get the job done. You cannot be someone who melts under pressure. You have to know how to quickly problem solve. And if you're gonna be the leader, everyone's looking to you because, and if you freak out, people are gonna start jumping in with all these ideas and it's gonna, I don't get me wrong. It's important to listen to other people's ideas but you need to be the leader and be the person that is calm and in control and assessing and saying, okay, this is what we're gonna do. This, this talent isn't here yet. We're in segment three. I'm gonna have, uh, we're gonna flip segment three and four and we're gonna have the host do this. And then when talent comes with segment three, we're gonna do that. Does everybody copy? We copy, boom, and you move on, okay? So you've got to learn how to pivot. Next, number seven, collaborate. Collaborating is essential. Um, you collaborate at work and you with colleagues on outside projects. Um, TV production and film production, I don't care like, if you're the director or the producer, it's a team sport. You cannot do it alone. And um, especially in you know, television, like Hollywood television, when you come in to direct a television show, you're not in charge as much as you, you might wanna think that, you're not in charge. There's a showrunner who has created this show. There's a group of writers who have written this show and you're a guest on this show. So you need to play nice and collaborate and bring their vision to life, okay? Even when you're doing your own film, you know, you have to work with your DP, you have to work with your PA, you have to work with talent, music, catering, all of it is connected. And so you can't come in there with an ego. My biggest thing is don't act like what you think a director is. Don't act like what you think a producer is. That's not it. Production is a team sport and the collaboration is the magic and the fun of it all, right? I love seeing sets being built when I'm like, oh, can we put it over here? And the hard work and people are working 18 hours a day, right? So you, can't, you must treat people with respect and um, remember that you're all collaborating. Um, okay, this one's really important, equally important. Um, you need to learn the business side of show business, okay? What does that mean? You need to know the trades, the terms, and the trends in television. So let's talk about terms. You need to know what an act out is, a blow, a rundown, live to tape, block and shoot, cross boarding, a runner, OTS, two-hander, genre, beachy, linear. These are all things from a variety of different genres of television. So the good thing is I've done all of them. I've done the journalists, 
journalism. I've done docu-series. I've done live television. I've done scripted, right? So these are all terms that when you're on these sets, people are using and they're carrying, they're not explaining it to you, right? They expect you to know it. So for whatever genre it is that you're in, if they're saying, okay, you know, we want to hire you to direct this, um, but we'll be cross-boarding um, the all five episodes. What does that mean? What that means is instead of each episode being its own entity, we're going to shoot all the scenes that are in the living room, let's say, of episode one through six first. So we're gonna be from episode to episode versus shooting everything within that episode and then going to the next, right? So it's important that you guys know these terms for whatever um, field that you're trying to go into. Um, and then in terms of the trades, you should be reading the trades. I know that people have told you this before. I remember people telling me and I'm like, why do I have to read the trades? I don't get it. It's a bunch of gibberish. I don't get it. I don't know these people. Guess what, guys? It's so weird. I know so many of these people now. Um, but it's because I've been reading and been going out and um, been networking. So Variety, Deadline, Shadow and Act, The Hollywood Reporter. Why are you reading it? The first is so that you can know what's going on. So you can know some of the trends. So you can know um, what shows are coming out. So that if you see, oh my gosh, Pete Chapman just got um, added, he's going to be the pilot director for this, or the producing director for this new season of this show. Okay, what does that mean? Oh, I just, I just, um, we just heard from him. That means he's in charge of helping um, hire the directors for the entire season. He's the lead director on that show you need to know that. So you need to know that ahead of time, right? So it's people that you're knowing and you're seeing, oh, they're doing a new show about, about skateboarding. That's my passion. That's what I do on the side. I have a script about this. Let me send this into this production company who's looking, right? Or what um, my live crew, what we do, and it was so funny. It's so funny what we do, but Kristen is a part of it. So I remember it was, it was in the fall and there was an announcement that um, the Image Awards, which we'd all worked on, it was like a group of five or six of us, um, the Image Awards would now be produced by, it, it had been produced, it had been aired on TV One and it was now going to be airing on BET. We're all like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, what does this mean? So we're on this text chain together and we're like, okay, who, who's going to be producing it? Do we think it's going to go to Jesse Collins? Well, maybe it's going to go to, well, no, he normally, put, and so you need, you read the trades to strategize to get your next gig, right? Because you need to know who's the production company now, and then you need to be reaching out. By the time they're saying the show airs tomorrow, the cast is, I mean, the, the crew is already set up, but when they're making that early announcement of there's been a change, there's been a change. This is who's now producing. That's when you are getting that intel on future work, right? So it might be that you see that Jordan Peele has a new deal and he's going to be doing such and such and such. Well, now you can strategize if you have something similar. Oh, he's doing a game show? You know, whatever it is, it's information, right? Um, and then learning the business so that you know, again, these terms. So... Um, and the trends. So a spec versus a pilot. There was a time when if you wanted to be a writer on a TV show, you would spec their spec a show, which means you would write an episode of a show that already existed, whether it's Atlanta or This Is Us, you would write your own version of that show. Well, the trends have changed now. Nobody wants to see a spec anymore. So unless you're trying to get into a writing program, um, which they take specs, otherwise different showrunners, they wanna see a pilot. And what a pilot is, is your original work, your original concept, your original this, like if, if you, you know, came up with a show that could air, they wanna see that because they wanna see what your voice is and what your world is. And that's what they're looking at to hire people. 
um, that's a shift. That's a shift in the industry. So you need to be aware of that. Um, you need to be aware of, you know, when they're calling sitcoms versus comedies. What does that mean? Because I really didn't know. Well, guess what? Sitcom is really multicam. So those are like your traditional, um, you know, Martins. I'm like, what's what's on now? Well, obviously, Family Reunion, Netflix. Um, but like the neighborhood, um, you know, they're they're the shows where it has multiple cameras. It's on a stage. There's a live audience. Comedy is now considered single cam. Right. So, yeah, they're both comedies, but they just call it comedy and it's a single cam. Um, it's your insecures. It's your Atlanta. OK. Um, and then live stream. Um, what do they call it? Um, the trend to call things linear. Right. Linear is a new thing that's happening. Um, the same way that they would have, you know, when I was coming up, they'd have linear editing and nonlinear editing. So linear was like on that system and it was just, you have to do it in order. And nonlinear is what we're all doing now, which is the Avids, the premieres, the Final Cut Pros. Well, now on television, because of digital and streaming, you have your linear television, which is what is being broadcast on the network in order, and this is when you watch it, versus your streaming, your digital. So if as you're going into these, um, whether it's a meeting, whether it's an interview, whether it's you strategizing, you need to learn the business so that you can understand where you fit in or where you want to fit in, okay? Um, number nine is find balance. It is a hustle for sure um, in television. Um, and it's really important that you find balance between work and your family and your friends. Um, and you live a life where it's equally important because the reality is some jobs will try to just run you ragged and you've got to protect your space, especially now in the age where you are able to be contacted at any time. You've got to set boundaries that you um, keep for yourself, whether you state them or not, it just might be, this is how I flow. I'm not answering emails at after 9 p.m., you know, or phone call, whatever it is, um, but allow yourself to um, have the time to live a life and to engage with people and do things that are important to you. The other reason this is important, it goes back, especially if you're trying to be a writer in television or a director in television, um, everyone, and this goes back to the passion of it. Let's say you collect stickers or you are into butterflies or, you know, when you're anything that seems like, oh, that's irrelevant is actually the most relevant part. So when you're doing like your bio, include what is your passion, because they might be looking for someone who knows how to ride a unicycle, you know, or knows the culture of skateboarding. You know, what I mean, if you don't include it can't just be a list of things, your passion and um, the things that you do when you're not working um, inform your world and inform your ability to be a value in a writer's room, to be a value as a director, to be a value as a producer, okay? Um, so the fact that I love dance and, you know, started, I danced at, at Prairie View, I danced before that, um, I was on the step team, I ended up getting an episode so with stepping and family reunion and I was able to kill it and it was amazing. Um, but whenever I go in meetings, I tell people like dance is my first love, you know, and da, 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 da. And it's important. So that's why I'm saying your passions are important. Don't forget those. Kristen is, as you know, an avid roller skater. <laughs> so when, if there's a show coming out, she could be like, no, no, no. I know this world. You know what I'm saying? That's what's important. And that will give you a leg up on someone who, yeah, maybe they can write really great, but they don't know. They can't add anything to the story. All right. Um, and then my final is give back. You've got to give back. Um, whether it's at work, um, volunteering, taking people under your wing, whether it's personally or within a formal group. Um, Sharing knowledge and opportunities is 
important. There's some people who want to hoard information or they're um, scared or fearful, but there's your only competition is yourself. Okay. So, um, you know, there's been so many situations where I have seen and identified people who I'm like, I'm going to help that person. Um, or I see something in them and they're ready for this. I have people that started as PAs with me that I'm like, you're ready to be a producer because I've helped nurture them. Not for any reason other than I know that they can do great. And sometimes you need that information. Um, you will, and, and it comes back to you. There's so many people who have helped me along the way, um, whether a great word, whether giving opportunities, um, or information. So it really is important to give back um, and just with an open heart. So those are my top 10 commandments for thriving in uh, the film and TV business. Ooh. Ooh. When, when you ask a person to teach you a thing, you came and gave us 10 mega jewels there. I, yes, thank you so much much thank you oh wow i you know it's funny because I, I listened to you um you know run down the 10 commandments commandments and listen to your journey and um i, I think i want to ask the students to open their mics and open their cameras and engage in a conversation with you but if you can start with what when you left prairie view as it was time for you to start preparing your your journey away from the hill mm -hmm. um you're a senior you're a rising senior maybe you're going into your last year there Tell us about the mindset. Tell us how you, did you prepare yourself for leaving the safety of Prairie View? Mm, that's a great question. You know, I fell in love with Prairie View and um, it really, um, you know, my high school and my junior high was very multicultural, but was also like predominantly white. Um, and so, you know, I'm not trying to, but I was like in these gifted and talented whatever courses and would be one of the few black people there, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I went to Prairie View, it was such a relief because there was something for all of us, you know, and they, at the time they had the Benjamin Banneker Honors College and that's kind of how I got in. I got a full ride to PV and it was a group of really, talented, amazing people from across the country that were mm -hmm. like um, pulled into Prairie View, including my line sister, Maya Rockymore, who's running for governor of Maryland. Hey, hey. So um, <laughs> leaving was not difficult because I had, I had a, a network and a family, you know, of people. And it was, it was funny because, you know, most everyone is from a lot, the majority of people are from Texas. But what ended up happening is like four or five people, they all ended up in DC. And so we were able to kind of, you know, continue that bonding, but two things that happened. I think I, I, I was gonna walk, let's say it was, okay, I pledged spring 92, it was 93. I think I was, I walked in 93, but I think maybe it was, I could have been, whatever it was, I know that I came back just to have fun for like a couple of weeks. I wasn't ready. So <laughs> right. um, I remember I came back um, cause I was gonna walk like that May, but I, I don't sure. remember now, it was a long time ago. But I think that I had already had a job lined up because of the Washington Post. Um, mm -hmm. And I had, I went, it was called the Bureau of National Affairs. It's now owned by Bloomberg. So I had something lined up. Uh, I think for me, um, the story that you don't know is that my mom was a journalist. And so mm. she, um, you know, she kind of started um, in, at the AP actually, and one was one, was one of the few black women um, journalists. She actually ended up having to sue them and is the reason that they have um, scholarships for um, women and minorities, not scholarships, internships. Um, mm -hmm. but she, she was that, and then, you know, she worked kind of in the, um, kind of PR communications. So it was, it felt like something that was in my blood and it almost felt like it was something I had to do. As I remember having this serious talk with her, I was like, mom, I don't want to be a journalist anymore. 
And she was like, I don't care. Do what you want. You know, so for me, it was like, I thought it was being pressured on me, but it wasn't. So that was when, you know, I was taking that turn of finding my passion. Um, But it was an exciting time, you know, being out of college and kind of in this new world was an exciting time. Um, And so I, you know, you, you learn to take leaps along the way. And that's what I encourage everyone to do, you know, um, continue to take leaps. Cause you know, you, you can get too comfortable in a place. Right. And yeah, so you have yeah. to, okay, I'm going to take that leap. So like you're graduating from Prairie View. If there's something you want to do, if there's a city you haven't been, if there, do it, you know, don't just be so comfortable and stuck in, you know, that's, that's, I guess the advice I would give. Yeah. You're starting to see, you're starting to see some of the amazing faces of our current Panthers. Uh, Why don't you all engage with our guest here today? Go ahead and open your mic and ask your questions. Miss Evans, you spit, you spit a lot of facts right there. A lot of (laughs) great stuff. We are very much in common. No wonder you're successful. (laughs) (laughs) I had a question for you. Um, You talked about when you moved to Los Angeles and you had to build your network from the ground up. I would really like for you to tell us all here how exactly you did that detailed. Mm -hmm. Well, I gave you a little bit of it, but really it was a few things. Um, I took jobs that were, you know, I I got rid of my ego. So that means I took jobs where, you know, you know, there's a hierarchy and PA is like the, on the lower end in terms of the seniority, not on the lower end in terms of importance. So, I was showrunner, show creator, and I went back and took PA jobs because it wasn't just for the work of like, I need the money, but it was to get to know people. So that's one thing. Um, I reached out. I remember the first person who got me, I was just like, I'm, I'm running into like brick walls. I reached out to, you know, I had friends who had worked, I worked with at MTV News. And one of them was at E. To me, it was like a no brainer. Of course you'll go to E. You've done, you know, you've done this, you've done entertainment television and I could not get a job. And so she, I was like, what should I do? She connected me with, I think it was the VP at E and he met with me. And so him meeting with me because that's my friend and she's vouched for me because I always do great work. Him meeting with me is now a power thing, then that set up meetings for me to meet with other people. And that really helped me break in because I got a job on one show. And then after that, I got a job on another show at E. Um, So that's one way. So that's again, your network. So we're talking about network and ego. Um, And also I'm trying to think, a lot of it is network and reaching out to people Mm -hmm. saying I'm available. Oh, here's a big thing. Here is a huge thing. Um, the game had changed. Uh, the, the titles have changed. I was a producer. And as a producer, that meant I wrote the scripts. That meant I would go and shoot um, in the field. And that meant that I would be in post and I would be uh, cutting it together and producing it to, um, to air on TV. That was all the one job for me as a producer. Now it's okay. You are, are you a field producer? That's just the person who goes in the field. Are you a post producer? That's just the person who does it. And they're not, it doesn't cross over. That's the person who goes in the edit once the stuff has, has happened, right? Are you the writer? You're separate. So I was like, the term producer didn't mean anything anymore right? Because these different jobs existed. My girl, Kristen Carter, who I don't remember how we met. I feel like she reached out to me because she was moving to LA and we were in, uh, there's another group called Black Girls Rule um, that different people were a part of in the entertainment industry. And she reached out to me cold, but we've developed a friendship. Um, It's been over 10 years. And anyway, um, I remember she reached out to me because there was a job available. And she was like, um, we need to redo your resume. <laughs> and I was like, really? She's like, yes. 
uh, compartmentalize it, this, this, and this, because I was doing chronological. So again, things are changing, the industry is changing. And I even adjusted some of my titles to fit what they knew, you know what I mean, um, the job was. And so that's, Kristen, that was a huge thing for me because it enabled me to get um, jobs because we're now speaking the same language. Right. And I think that happens a lot as generational and as a job switch. And so that's what I'm saying. Always, um, always adjust to new tools and just be aware of trends, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, I mean, essentially that's it, you know, networking um, in terms of the, um, because my biggest thing was I came to LA to transition to the scripted side. So I needed to know that, um, I didn't know anyone in scripted. I knew, I knew people and I was starting to know a lot of people, but they're all on the unscripted side, which is reality and docu and live entertainment. That's a whole nother world and it's insulated. So slowly but surely I started. Um, one of the things I did was I, um, I took uh, some writing courses. Um, again, you're meeting people. So there was a little bit of crossover I produced I was pregnant with my son. I produced the red carpet for the Oscars for E. Um, one of the PAs there was Lena Way. She was really cool and dope. And this was like, she was a PA, I was a producer. And, you know, we connected. And I remember we, um, we were working on the Oscars, but the Image Awards was coming up. And she's like, I got tickets to the, we got free tickets. And so we like, um, snuck away and went to the image awards um to be in the audience because we got free tickets she had she had pa'd on girlfriends but you know she was kind of making the the transition herself so she was doing pa work on this um you know on this script unscripted show and uh, that's a friendship that's developed you know and i've seen obviously as you have her entire trajectory um and, you know, it was a few years later where she was rocking the red carpet and I'm like producing the red carpet. So just different, knowing different people, you don't, you don't know who's going to do what. That's why your interactions have to be authentic. You know what I mean? Um, don't just make friends with people because, um, but just over time, um, me taking writing classes and then now I know all these writers and then like four years later, they're on shows. You know what I'm saying? So, and I know I've heard Issa Rae say this, it's like you grow up with the people you're with. It's not always necessarily the people that are already where you wanna be. It's the people that you're with now because you're all kind of growing up at the, you know, at the same time. So that's the general answer. You, you have to build, you have to keep working, you have to network. You have to do good work. All of those things that I said. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Great wisdom. Good. Who else has a question? Okay, I have a question. Hi. Hi. Okay, so earlier you were talking about how the industry changed a lot after the recession and how things were different. So my question to you is kind of like a two-part question. But how do you think the industry will change after the whole corona pandemic? And what jobs do you think will be available for someone who's post-grad or just someone who's just new to LA or New York or wherever they want to move? Okay, I'm going to answer the easy one first, which is what jobs will be available. I remember when I was in grad school and one of my colleagues was like, I talked to a professor and they said they think we can get a PA job um, out of... Um, and I was like, oh my God, really? Yes, because that's standard. So you got, I thought this was some <laughs> magical thing, right? PA jobs are what are available to you now. PA jobs, assistant mm -hmm. jobs. Um, the great thing is production assistant or PA jobs can be in any aspect of production, right? It can be in post, it can be in the field, it can be creative, it can be in development. Um, it can be in uh, art design, it can be in wardrobe, it can be, so again, what are your passions? Maybe you PA in different things until you find the part that you love, but those jobs are available to you now, okay? So don't let anyone tell you otherwise. What you need to do is while you're doing this right now, you need to, um, so that your resume and your reel shows that you understand production. But PA work can be anything from 
making copies, um, writing things in an organized way, making lists, um, helping to find props, whatever it is, what people are looking for is, are people who are resourceful, people who are reliable, right? And that you use your brains. You might know way more than what the PA job is. And that's what I was saying earlier, but that's where you get, get in. That's where you start, okay? So any productions that you see, let me tell you guys a story. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this was, I was in DC. And I, like I said, I was in film school at AU. And the thing with DC is so many TV shows, I mean, not TV shows, movies come to DC that they need that, like they need those shots, right? So they might come yeah. for a week or so. So I, again, um, there's a film commission in each city and that's how you find out about jobs. So that's the thing. It's like, once you get one, you're on the list and they start calling you if you do good work, right? So I heard about this. It was a magical, wow, I didn't know this existed. I heard that, was it Enemy of the State? No, it was Deep Impact. That's how far back this goes. Deep Impact, the disaster movie that Spielberg um, produced, but it was directed by Mimi Leader. They were coming to town. This is the days of faxes, you guys. I'm gonna take you to a land <laughs> where you had to fax people. For some weird reason, I had a fax machine. I think someone in a building threw it out and I plugged that joint in and it worked. So I was <laughs> in business in my apartment and I found out that they were coming. I faxed my resume to them. I called. They're like, we are not looking for anyone. Thank you, click. Okay, then I hear from someone, yeah, they still haven't got everyone. I come back, hi, this is Mornique, da, 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 da. Um, we're not looking for anyone. No, we're not. Okay, thank you. I hear they haven't staffed the PAs. I call again. Um, Mornique, can you come in to meet with us? I wore them down, but in the proper <laughs> way. I ended up, that was my first job. My first Hollywood job was a PA for Deep Impact. Let me tell you what the job was. I don't know if you've seen the movie, but an asteroid is coming. It's coming to get you. We, it was 4 a.m. So our call time was 4 a.m. Okay. We were on some street where, some highway where normally, let's say there's two, you know, there's two going one way, two going the other, and like a little middle grass patch. It was in a state. Yeah, it was at least a mile long, right? Yeah. Each PA had a section, a mile long of cars packed in, because this was when everyone was trying to get out, right? Everybody yeah, was trying yeah, to yeah. Get, get away. So um, we each had a section <laughs> and we had to, when they called action, they had a helicopter that everybody's looking at because that's the asteroid, right? It's coming. So, Everyone's looking, they're honking, you know, Elijah, I think it was Elijah Wood, um, you know, mm -hmm. he's going by on his bike and um, everyone's trying to get, get away. And so everyone, all the extras are there and they drive maybe, I don't know, three feet, four feet and look, and they have to look. And so we're in there, but we also have to blend in. And then they yell cut and it's back to one. Y'all know what back to one is? Everyone go to your first position. So we had to like direct all the cars and get them back to their first position. We had about oh, like yeah. a half mile of a section. And then yeah. our, um, our like base camp was like maybe another mile away. They gave us these janky bikes. I don't know where they came from. Um, mine, I don't believe had a like a full bike seat. All I know is like I could barely move the next day but it was the most fun I've ever had in my life. Um, but it was ridiculous. Like I could not move and we were just biking back and forth and just getting people back to one. Meaning like, okay, you back up here and we can't, they can't crash, right? None of that stuff. And also you're running back and forth and you're on your walkie and they need this there and they need this there. So that was my first job. Um, and from that, I kept getting work because now you're on the list and like, oh, she did pretty good. So it's really just about being resourceful. You're, it's not your full skills of producing it, it's about being resourceful. Um, and so, yeah, I worked on that. I worked on 
Enemy of the State. Um, I can't even, I worked on From Earth to the Moon, which is on HBO. Mm. And mm -hmm. again, there were all these, you know, once you're on the list, I got a call every, you know, I got calls. And that's how it happens. Um, mm. And so I forgot about that. Wow. Um, so that's, <laughs> yes, PA, that's the short answer. Yeah. What is going to happen? It's funny you mentioned. It's funny you mentioned that scene from Deep Impact. It's Deep Impact is one of my favorite movies. Ah! Guilty pleasure. Like if if it if it's on FX or something, if I you know flip through the channels and it's on, I I tend to stay. Yeah. And one of my one of my like biggest questions about that film happens in the scene that you're talking about. So yeah. Elijah Wood comes through on the motorcycle. Yeah. He's looking for old girl. He yeah. goes past the minivan. They honk the horn. Right. He stops. Yeah. He gets off the bike. He gets off the motorcycle he's on to go back and talk to old girl. And I'm like, why hasn't someone stolen his stolen bike? bike? I know. I would have. It makes me crazy every time I get to that point in the film. I'm like, the bike is literally still running. It's out there, yeah. I've been on it. Deuces. Yeah. yeah. There was no room. Oh, that is that, awesome. Though. It was just that <laughs> ramp. So he had to take a <laughs> risk, but I would have jumped on that bike. No. <laughs> For sure. Who else has a question for Morinike? Oh, wait, let me just answer really quick. Oh, yeah. What the, um, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen for production. <clears throat> oh, you yeah. know that, um, you know, again, when we're saying production, it's a team sport and it's collaborative and, you know, it's sometimes, you know, between, you know, it could be anywhere from 10 to 100 people <clears throat> on set. So, um there's definitely going to be some changes. I think in general, it'll be, and they've put out some kind of early guidelines of what they think, um, which I, I can like provide a link that she can share. But, um, you know, even down to craft service, you know, you have someone who's walking around bringing food that's open. You have a place where you can just, you know, pick food that that's going to change in terms of how food is presented. Um, you know, maybe there'll be less people that'll be allowed on set and there'll be more closed sets. Um, you know, people being tested, you know, maybe two weeks before and then again a week before. I'm not sure. Um, I do know that as a live producer also, a lot of productions are pivoting and because of social media are able to pivot. So if you understand how to produce live um, and if you um, know the certain tools that exist, um, something, try, something, I can't remember it. There's different tools where you can edit and produce and switch live from your home. You know, there might be more of those types of shows. Um, I know I got called to do, you know, I got called to produce like a live Instagram show. Um, but basically that's, you know, in that case, it's not being there to produce, but it's making sure producing is organizing, communicating, facilitating and troubleshooting. Okay. Hmm. So it would be making sure this person has this information. They know how to log on making sure that the fiasco of the baby face um, <laughs> uh, doesn't happen the first time, right? Right, you know, yeah. Stuff ahead of time so that you've tested the audio, <laughs> you've tested it if you're trying to do, you know, a stream on, a, on another platform at the same time. Yeah. All of those things, you communicate, they know, okay, what do I need to do to, um, you know, to add this person in? So, you know, that's what producing is. So there's, there's going to be production isn't stopping, um, but adjustments will be made. Sure. Mm -hmm. Sure. Next question. Anyone? I Let's have a question. Are there any questions? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. How's it going Ms. Uh, Ms. Evans? Uh, I'm Justin Amaro. Uh, first off, I wanted to say thank you so much for, you know, coming to talk to us. A lot of what you said is extremely informative and I'm, I'm absorbing all of it like a sponge. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm glad. Um, my question is, um, whenever you're having a dry period, mm -hmm. like not when, whenever there's a pandemic or whenever, you know, business is flourishing, um, what would be your best advice whenever you're losing motivation and you're getting discouraged whenever you can't find any jobs? Mm -hmm. That's a great question because um, it really is feast or famine in, in production, um, at least especially out here. Sometimes you have like so much work that you're like, or like, you've been out of work and then everybody wants you to work that same week, right? And you're like, you can't. 
So um, it's a few things. And, and for me, it's been um, a journey in even trying to, to get there um, because it's about kind of having faith and also just being adjusting and pivoting. So for me, I always try to, again, do my creative work. Um, but a lot of times when you are working, especially if it's 18 hour days, it's harder. So I just always continue to do that. And, and because also I'm, I'm a parent, there's some days when I can't go to certain things. So then when it's like, if I have a week off or three weeks off or a month, I'm really pushing myself into like that quality time with my family because I might be two weeks out of town or a month away on these crazy jobs. So it's really about not panicking. Again, it's so important to continue to be creative. Um, that's when I have, I still have meetings with people, um, people that I haven't had an opportunity because of work to connect with, see how they're doing. That's really the networking of it all. I hate the term networking, um, but it is, it is a thing. And it's, uh, for me, I just, it's, for me, it's friendships, whether they're professional or personal, and sometimes they become both. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of times, even when I'm not working, I'm meeting with people, um, I'm creating so that I always have, um, other things going. And uh, recently I was like, you know, I, especially since I've transitioned kind of to the scripted side and I feel like I was able to nurture a lot of people in, in, um, television, that doesn't really exist there because the shows aren't filming for as long that I started like my own kind of like academy where I can teach the next generation. So that's something I did and I, I loved and I'm continuing to do. So, I mean, I think it's always important to create your own opportunities. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. One last final burning desire question. With me. Uh, okay. I was gonna ask it. Um, hi, I'm Whitley Riley. Um, I'm an aspiring screenwriter, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering, like, if I have what I think is a really good idea for a show, and I wrote a pretty nice script, like, how should I get my idea out there? Like, should I film like a teaser for the show and then put it on YouTube, or should I send my pilot script to like companies? Hmm. Great question. You could do either. Um, this is what I would do. Um, first, I would have several people read it that you trust um, to get feedback, to make sure it's the best possible script that it can be. Um, a lot of times, newer writers are afraid to do that, but that's not the move. Because what I found, and this took me a second, and again, um, you know, when I started going to these writing classes, you know, it's a bunch of writers and they're new and not all of them have broken in and we're all sharing our ideas, but there's a code and we're helping each other make their, their script better without any, you owe me this, but it's like, uh, that's not really making sense right there. Or what if you did this? And so you need, um, other writers to, um, help you other minds to help you oh what if she you know it's happening too early here or i'm not really connecting with the you need that critique and that feedback mm -hmm. regardless all writers do it it's important so my number one thing is find a group of like-minded people that you trust to work on that script with when it's at the place that you want it to be it really depends on what you want do you want to sell this to a network um or do you want to do it yourself? Do you know what I'm saying? Do you want to sell it and, and be hands off? Because a lot of times what happens um, is if you're newer, um, they, will, they might pair you with someone else or they might just, you get the created by credit, but you're not um, actively involved in producing that show. Mm -hmm. So you have all those different options along the way. You know, you can, it's really about your leverage and, and your track record, right? So if you want to like do a con concept video of it, you can do that to try to sell it, but you really need to think about where you want to be and what you're willing to, to take for that deal. And you need to have multiple ideas, right? So that maybe this one is the one that you sell or this one is your baby, but you get one other one to sell so that you can build your, you know, your track record. Mm -hmm. um, 
for me, you know, if you want to be a writer in television, you also need to be using that very script as your calling card. So you should be submitting it to contests and festivals so that you can get staffed on a show, right? And so then that will also be like, oh, she got staffed on the show with this project. Has anyone produced this yet? Let's, let's see if we can talk to her about that, right? So use it for more than one thing. Um, use it to try to get into contests and staff. And that will help you um, get some visibility um, but also it will help you get the career, you know, to help launch the career you want or collaborate, shoot that shit yourself, excuse my language. Um, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and do it and it's yours and see if you can sell it to streaming or sell it to, you know, and build your audience. It's really about where do you want to go? We're not in a place right now where you need to ask permission to do your art. You do what you want to do with it. And someone can tell you no, but that doesn't mean it's a no for you. You know what I mean? It's just not with them. So you, you're not like, you're not in anybody else's hands waiting to get your, your show done. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you want to do it, I say do it. Just do it well. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Phenomenal, phenomenal time today. Thank you so much for joining us today and for virtually, kind of, sort of, <laughs> coming back on the hill yeah. without leaving your living room. See, you came back to the hill without leaving L.A. See, right. <laughs> um, we're going to follow up with you and with all of our guests um, over the series. I'm going to follow up. I'm putting together a syllabus. Um, it kind of came to me late, like kind of midway through the series where I thought this all of this information can be compiled and put into a really great uh, syllabus slash textbook for this particular series. Um, and um, I cannot wait to follow up with you and take those 10 commandments, if you will, and put it in this, this, this binder of, of good information that we've received from you and, and all of our guests over Absolutely. the course of the semester. I have a um, waiting for you. Well, awesome. Awesome. Can we, can we expect you this, this October back on the Hill for homecoming, you know, know provided. I'm not sure. I came there, <laughs> what, 2018 was the last time I was there. Okay. So um, it's possible, but I don't know yet. Well, so maybe we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way there, to make it worth your while. Is that, there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Everyone, this is, again, this has been a, a fantastic experience, a phenomenal um, opportunity for all of us to learn such great things from people working um, in the industry. Um, again, it just kind of started as a, a hope and a prayer that we can get through the semester, giving you enriching information via, via Zoom or, or a construct like this. And I think we've all kind of just been um, showered with an embarrassment of riches from our, our colleagues over the last couple of weeks. Um, all of the content is available on YouTube. You can watch it um, now. You can go back and see you know, the whole series from the beginning. Um, we have quite a few people who are watching just now um, on our live stream and so many hellos. Uh, Lisa Rossberg, who, Burrow, Ross Burrow, who has been at every single um, uh, speaker session. Uh, she works in the Office of Alumni, Alumni Affairs. So Morinike, she might be reaching out to you soon to, okay, to, awesome. to make that connection as alum. Um, and so many, so many awesome people who have supported along the way watching from YouTube. So thank you for watching from YouTube. And um, Professor Clomax. Can I say one last thing? Oh, absolutely, yeah. please. I just wanted to say um, that, you know, ha you guys haven't gone through this series and talked with so many people. I hope that the one thing that you do take away from this is that there's not one way to break in. You know what I mean? And so don't let anyone tell you this is the only way or that's the only way. Because as you've seen, all of our journeys are different. Um, but the common the commonalities are, you know, that the will and the passion and the hard work, okay? So you keep that, you will make it. The only reason you won't make it is if you decide you don't want to do it, to be yeah. perfectly honest. Keep yeah. going, 
Don't doubt yourself on those times when it feels like, there's been times when I'm like, I'm moving to Atlanta or I'm moving back. I can't do this anymore. Yeah. But in my heart, I knew that I had to keep pushing. And I'm telling you, it was literally right around the corner. So mm. just know that um, everybody's journey is different. Everyone's path is different and uh, keep going. Yeah. Uh, there are some questions about how to stay in touch with you after the fact. Um, hold off on giving that information. I don't want to necessarily give it out to the world, but what I am going to do with each speaker as a part of the follow-up is to ask uh, in, in an effort to stay in touch with you and, and with all the mentors as, as that we've had, what's the best way to reach you? So um, the follow-up questionnaire or PDF that you're going to get this afternoon is going to have that. And then students, I will share the compiled information with you um, on I'm um, my goal is to have it done by Thursday since now all the speakers have gone. And so um, the ebook will include links to each of the courses as well as additional links that they may provide to us um, as additional resources. Um, many of our speakers suggested different books that we should read. That mm -hmm. PDF is going to include um, by speaker their best resources, best takeaways, everything that they've discussed. Uh, I'm going to watch the videos all over again as well and transcribe some of the additional nuggets that um, they may not include in the survey. And when I finish this compilation, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful binder um, for each of our students and each of our guests to um, go back and, and use this as a, um, a living binder. As I said before, we're going to redo a series um, this summer. The focus this summer, um, having met virtually met um, quite a few of our alum uh, who are watching the series and are like, oh, you know what? I work for this news network, um, you know, in, in Indianapolis, Troy Washington reached out to us. She graduated uh, from Prairie View and um, is a news anchor in Indianapolis. Um, there's just a wealth of people who um, would like to participate in a forum like this. And so the, the series that I want to do this summer will feature um, I'm thinking maybe a 15 part series again to feature alum from Prairie View. So if you're out there watching and you graduated from Prairie View a &M University um, and you work in a field, a communication focused field, um, you know, we'd like to reach out to you and have you on for the series. Um, Maureen Ike, thank you again, sister. I appreciate you. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Ta Teresa. Wait, did I say it wrong? <laughs> Teresa, like Vanessa, but Teresa. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. All right. Bye, y'all.